where you're standing. <sighs> A real estate investor reacts to National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. That's today's show. Let's get to it. Hey everyone, I'm Clayton Morris, longtime real estate investor. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe because we aim to help you build financial intelligence and financial freedom here on the show. That's what we that's what we do. And we focus around real estate investing, but we also teach you all manner of passive income. So today we're going to watch one of my all-time favorite Christmas movies, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation with Chevy Chase. We're going to dive into it and we want to analyze this movie because there's so many takeaways as a real estate investor in this movie. And at the end, stick around to the end, make sure you stick around to the end because we're going to see if Clark Griswold is financially intelligent or he's financially ignorant. So stick around to the end of the show. And of course, be sure to comment, leave your thoughts about Clark and the whole family as a real estate investor in the comment thread below. We will love your feedback and please let us know. And you can disagree with me if you like or agree with me, I don't care. I'd love to see your comments below. All right, let's get to one of the best Christmas movies of all time. Let's go. Like any good road trip, I mean, this was me growing up with my parents and, you know, we were so annoyed on a regular basis by having our parents do these long winded road trips for eight hours down to North Carolina. And it was such a pain in the butt. And of course, you know, having my dad make his terrible dad jokes the whole time. So this is exactly what it was like in my house growing up. But, you know, look, also, the power of financial freedom, right? If Clark actually had financial freedom, he didn't have to worry about going into work every day. He could be spending extra and more time with his kids. Although, if you watch this clip, I'm not exactly sure that his kids would want to hang out with him. Dad, can you explain again what we're doing? Sure, Russ. We're kicking off our fun old-fashioned family Christmas by heading out into the country in the old front-wheel <laughs> drive sleigh to embrace the frost I love the and the of the winter landscape. And select that most important of Christmas symbols. We're not driving all the way out here so you can get one of those stupid ties with the Santa Clauses on it, are we, Dad? No, I have one of those at home. No, I already have one of those. What we're looking for today is the Griswold family Christmas tree. So going out and trying to find the good old family Christmas tree. And, you know, so many people still do that. I never did that. As a kid, you know, growing up, my sister actually had an allergy to Christmas trees. I don't know if you guys had a real, actually, well, let's have a debate about it. Did you have a real or an artificial tree? So my sister had a, an allergy to real Christmas trees. So we had to have an artificial tree uh, for my whole childhood. And, uh, and, but I love the idea of the holiday traditions because dads, I know that I'm, I'm becoming like my dad now, which is to stick to those traditions, regardless of what the kids want. Mom, I can't feel my hips. Clark. Yes, honey. Audrey's frozen from the waist down. Uh, that's all part of the experience, honey. I love how far away they are from civilization. There it is. <laughs> There's the tree. It's 50 feet high. Let's get that tree in the car. And then, of course, no one brought a saw. So they've been walking for 30 minutes and now they've got to go back and get a saw to put this thing on. But a good reminder as a real estate investor, in fact, we just went through this recently on a property. You've got to make sure that if you're cutting down any kind of trees, you have to have a permit for it. And especially when you're going out and getting Christmas trees. But if you live in a homeowner's association, sometimes you'll have all kinds of restrictions and covenances within the homeowner's association that you cannot cut back trees. We had a homeowner's association that we lived in from 30 feet from the lake. You cannot cut down any trees unless they're dead. So make sure you check with your, your uh, homeowners association, your covenants is there because you can be fined severely for these things. But making sure, you know, these Christmas tree farms, you have to get a permit. You can't just walk, walk into somebody's woods and, and grab a Christmas tree. <laughs> My all time favorite clip. Look at Julie Louis-Dreyfus. She's so great. Toad overestimated the height of his living room <laughs> <laughs> Hey Griswold, where do you think 
you're going to put a tree that big. Bend over and I'll show you. There's one of those movie lines that I repeat all the time around the house. I wasn't talking I to you. I love that. I wasn't talking to you. Now, in the real estate world, you are going to have neighbors to tenants, tenants to neighbors who are a huge pain in the butt. Now, this gets into some tricky areas, and depending on state laws, if you've got if you've got neighbors that are just absolutely annoying you, noise violations, big dogs, it doesn't really matter. You can, of course, report them. Every state is going to have different uh, ordinances, restrictions on what people can do. Um, we we on a, an investment property that we had, we had a, a woman who we talked about it on our show right here, a woman who had some big big dogs, um, but she exceeded the weight limit of the dogs. And it was scaring the neighbor kids. And the child who lived next door in this duplex uh, was a disabled child, and it was scaring this child. And so what do you do, right? So we had to go through an eviction process. We gave her warnings about this size limit of the dogs that she, she agreed to in her property management agreement, and she ignored it and violated the terms of the property management agreement. And then on top of it, she stopped paying. So then we had to go through an eviction process. So. I've actually heard horror stories sometimes with neighbors of ten uh, on rental properties, and the neighbors were like white supremacists, and they didn't want somebody of a different ethnicity moving in next door, and they just harassed and harassed and harassed. So anytime the property manager was trying to show this particular property, if they weren't of the right color to these people living next door, they were going to be harassed. And they would yell at them across the street. I mean, can you imagine? Like, this is, you know, the, the, the year we're living in right now, and that's still happening. But, you know, that's when you can get the law involved. Uh, and that's when you have to bring in some big guns. Unfortunately, it happens. Clark? <laughs> the size of this tree. Do you now, think there's enough room for the angel? Oh, sure, honey. I have a little more trimming to do, but that won't be a problem. Ready? I give you the Griswold family Christmas tree. Mm. A lot of sap in here. Mm. It looks great. A little full. A lot of sap. Just a little sappy in here. Now, you know, this is a perfect example of what you have to deal with sometimes with tenants and rental properties. Because you have a tenant that wants to decorate for Christmas and we have a lot of tenants that will totally deck out the property and yet sometimes they break stuff. And this is why you want to make sure you've got a, an ironclad property management agreement and of course a security deposit from your property manager. So the property manager is going to make sure that if windows get broken because of your, your Christmas tree decorating, that that's going to come out of your security deposit. Um, and in fact, guess what? you may even have to pay more probably gonna have to pay though for those repairs that's tenant damage that should not fall back to the homeowner now of course tenants may try to lie sometimes and say that we had nothing to do with that i didn't break those windows uh, so it can be sometimes a he said she said things but again this is also why you want to have insurance on a rental property so to cover things like this now tenant damage is inevitable but sometimes you know common sense goes out the window uh, with people. All right, now we're getting into the heart of the movie. And really, when we start dissecting passive income, financial freedom, and having to deal with a W-2 employment. This will be looking a nice fat Christmas bonus this year, huh? Word is you're an excellent choice to be named food uh, additive designer of the year. <sighs> Not kidding. So what's that new thing you got over there at Food and Drug? Oh, the Crunch Enhancer? Yeah, it's a non nutritive cereal varnish. It's semi permeable. It's not osmotic. What it does is it coats and seals the flake, prevents the milk from penetrating it. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful product. I like it. Oh, the, the big question is, cereal, uh, huh? what are you going to do with that big bonus check? You're going to blow it on yourself, I hope. Me? Heck no. Take a look at this. I just hope my Christmas bonus check will cover it. Oh, my God, you're putting in a pool. Oh, so here we go, right? This is the heart of it. We've talked endlessly here on the channel about performing assets and liabilities. So what is that? That's absolutely a liability. So he's going to get some big Christmas bonus. He's even putting a, a big deposit down, which we'll get to in a little bit in the movie. He's going to get this huge Christmas bonus, right? 
And I always say, never rely on a Christmas bonus. Never rely on a tax return. People get so excited that at the end of the year, they're going to get money back on their taxes. That means you're doing your taxes wrong. If the, if the government is holding on to your money, then you're doing your taxes wrong. That, that money should have been in your pocket and invested properly. So if you're getting a big check back, that ends up being a huge mistake. But furthermore, then he's relying on this Christmas bonus, and then he's going to buy a liability. And I'm not saying Christmas bonuses are bad. I've certainly given them out, you know, my company. But you're going to give away a Christmas bonus like this, then you better think about what you can do with that Christmas bonus. He's basically throwing it away by putting it into a pool. Um, I mean, imagine taking that money, that 7,500 that he put, that he's going to put down as a deposit. Uh, maybe he's putting down 20. Maybe it's going to cost him 20, 30,000. He could literally make a down payment or even buy outright a rental property that could produce cash flow for his family. So here we go, right? This is the heart of it. This is why the middle class end up staying poor and middle class because they buy liabilities and a swimming pool is an absolute liability. Oh, the boss is coming. The footstep of the boss. I love this guy. I went ahead and I put a $7,500 deposit down on it. You're the last true family man. Mark? Mm. Clark. That's Bill, sir. Are you the one who was working well, on that non know his name. cereal varnish? Yes, sir. I've got to give a speech to a trade group. I'd like to mention it. Write up a brief summary and have it to me by the end of the day. My pleasure. Layman's terms, none of that inside bull jargon that nobody understands. Yes, sir. My favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mrs. Shirley. Uh, we got your Christmas card the other day, and my family and I are very flattered that you remembered us. Corporate cards. Don't forget that. Uh, I love when he thanks Bill. these people. Yes, sir. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Kiss my ass. Kiss his ass. Kiss your ass. Happy Hanukkah. Uh, the boss. I mean, it's a perfect, you know, it's a perfect stereotype. 1980s boss, right? I don't know who you are. You work in my company, but I need something from you. I can't even remember your own name. Just a reminder. Do we want to work for somebody else, right? That W-2 job where he can't even remember your name. It's, you know, it's his company, he owns this company, and you are a cog in his wheel. And then, of course, he's, he's miserable, right? He's saying, you know, kiss my butt, kiss my butt, kiss his butt, you know, happy Hanukkah. He doesn't want to work there, and he doesn't want to deal with these people, uh, this entourage of lackeys that are all around this boss. Like, that should be the motivation he needs right there to kind of go out on his own and stake his own claim and become financially free, whether it's through buying a business himself, becoming a real estate investor, or otherwise. Come on, unravel these. You have to check every bulb. Whoops. Got a little knot here. Work on that. <laughs> Big ball of lights. I'll get the other box. Oh, I've been there. I have absolutely been there with my dad. So, I mean, growing up, you know, now that I think about it, I want to get my kids doing this because I uh, I was put through through hell as a result of having to do this. But my dad, maybe the first weekend after Thanksgiving get out the boxes of lights that were always tangled. He had thought that he wound them up properly so that they were in some kind of an arrangement. And then, then we would spend all Saturday and sometimes all Sunday out there freezing, trying to wrap these lights up around the trees and then hooking them up to the gutters and all over the trees. And sometimes they weren't aligned properly. And then inevitably one of the strands wouldn't have lights working, right? So we'd have to go and try to figure out and change the bulbs. And of course they were back then when they would get super hot. So they weren't even LED lights. They were the actual incandescent bulbs and they would burn your hand too. So it's a rite of passage. We, we are supposed to annoy our children. We are absolutely supposed to annoy our children. But this leads to an important part about being a rental owner. I hope he falls and breaks his neck. I'm sure he'll fall, but I don't think we're lucky enough to have him break his neck. No. Don't want him to be hurt. Let's go. Don't want that. But that's very important. So as he ascends this ladder, he's doing work on the outside of this house. Now let's just pretend he rented this house, right? 
Now you, as the owner, the landlord of this property, want to make absolutely sure. <laughs> My dad has definitely done that, gone up and the ladder has collapsed. You want to make sure though, as a rental owner, that you have your property in an LLC and you have insurance on that property. Because now, if this tenant does slip and fall and break his neck as the neighbors were hoping, and then that tenant is has slipped and fall because of something that happened on the property. Maybe there was you know something you didn't fix. A handrail was broken. Then they can of course sue you, right? And if they sue you, you better have that property inside of a uh, limited liability company so that they can only sue you inside of that asset. Okay, they're not going to be able to sue you for the primary residence that you own and your kids' college graduate. You know, kids kids uh, college fund and all of those other things. That's why you own rental property in an LLC. This exact reason, if he does slips and fall, and if it's because of something you uh, landlord uh, negligence, then of course they could come after you. So we don't want that to happen. Make sure you're protected, get it in an LLC, make sure you have insurance on it as well. My dad used to use these staples. It just makes me cringe. Nice soffit. You're putting these hard staples in there. <laughs> I think why I love this movie is because he's so earnest. And he does remind me a lot of my dad. Um, and I see a lot of myself in, in him too. You know, you have all the best intentions and then of course you do something klutzy or dumb. But another important point about rental property and another important point about damage to a property. So this tenant, if Clark were a tenant on this property, he has no right at all to be putting staples or nails into the roof to hold lights on or doing any kind of thing to the property beyond paint and doing, you know, hanging up pictures inside of the house. Um, so doing this kind of a thing on a rental property would be an absolute no-no and this again is when you want to make sure you've got a good property management team that you know checks on the property regularly and make make sure that the tenant isn't doing something crazy like this stapling things to your roof damaging the roof damaging a soffit because these are putting permanent holes in the wood and the fascia board on uh, on this property now so again it's a big no-no make sure that your tenants aren't doing that Love we'll getting you know stuck in the stuck in the attic. Now look at that flooring and the lack of insulation there, which I'll talk about. It's freezing up there. Don't mind if I have a little cold brew eggnog. Watch where you're standing. <sighs> yeah. And warm your hands up from all that heat coming up. All right, perfect, right? The attic, here's a big no-no, making sure that your properties are, are properly insulated because you're gonna be paying a boatload. And here's the thing with tenants, tenants don't want to end pay paying $200 for heat above and beyond what they should just because it's the house isn't properly insulated. Uh, and this is a key thing that will keep tenants from renewing a lease with you. If they go through a winter period in your rental property and you don't have your attic properly insulated or windows properly secured so that air doesn't just flow through and that tenant gets their electric bill because tenants pay their utilities in all of our properties they do. So they're paying their utilities and they're like, oh my gosh, our heat bill is through the roof. This is crazy right? They're going to say, we got to move. This house has poor ventilation. This house is poorly insulated. Let's, we're not renewing our, we're not, we are not renewing our lease here. We don't want to stay in this property. So making sure that your, your attic is properly insulated, uh, making sure that the walls are properly insulated. I see a lot of contractors doing cheap work where they're not properly insulating drywall. So here's a perfect example, the ceiling, right? And of course they should have had plywood over those beams and insulation in between them. So you at least have a walking surface up there, but he's standing right on the plaster and goes right through the ceiling. 
a big no-no. And so money just flowing right out the door um, in a waste on his electric bill. And speaking of electricity, let's watch. You know, my dad used to do this, and he's gonna be mad if I'm if I'm talking about this. But he used to have like multiple extension cords sticking out of a sconce light that was outside of our garage, and it would this thing would this I don't know flower of extension cords would be coming out of this thing, an absolute fire hazard, an absolute monstrosity. Now it's not funny, but I have heard stories. In fact, my sister had a rental property where she discovered it and there was fire damage because the tenant in order to avoid using certain electrical outlets in the house, ran a, an, uh, an extension cord outside to the power pole to the property, fried, fried the house as a result of it. So making sure that your electricity in the property that you own is up to code, making sure it's done by a licensed electrician who understands that. I have come across properties that we've bought where we've discovered that I don't know who in the world did the electrical work on this property, but it was certainly not up to code. And it's a huge fire problem if you don't get it taken care of. So don't make, don't make the Clark Griswold mistake of running that many extension cords into an outlet that's not even GFI, which means that if it trips, it doesn't you know, cause all kinds of problems later in the house. So great. Clark. Thanks, Eddie. I hope it enhances your holiday <laughs> spirit. Oh, Eddie's here. Eddie? Eddie? <laughs> What are you doing here, Eddie? This is gorgeous, Clark. <laughs> Eddie? I hope you didn't do this all on our account, Clark. <laughs> Kids, come on out here and see what Uncle Clark's done to the house. Eddie? <laughs> <laughs> Pay attention to the RV. All right. So, now, it's funny, right? Eddie, Eddie's funny, and so is his wife, and they're, they're wacky, and... They've got no money and they kind of live off the land and they're just a mess, right? But I want you to think about something interesting with Eddie. He pulls up in an RV that's paid off. Clark is living in a house with a mortgage and he's going further into debt, hoping that he gets this Christmas bonus. Who in this scenario is the winner? Debate it. I'd, lo I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Who do you think is the winner as I knock my, my reindeer cup? Take a moment. Think about this. Because he doesn't have a lot. He has, his RV is not a liability anymore, right? And the house, the mortgage, is. And it's not a performing asset. Now, the RV is not a performing asset either. But just begin to think differently about this, right? I've done a number of shows where we talk about your home is not an asset. Check out that in the card, please go check it out. Your home is not an asset. And so Clark might seem like he's all, he's got the nice car, he's got the nice house, but very often it's deceiving, isn't it? Because he is beyond stressed right now, waiting on this Christmas bonus. He put a big deposit down on this pool. He doesn't know if he's gonna get the money and he's still gotta sustain and pay for all this stuff, all this stuff that's like weighing him down. The reason this movie is so powerful in this way is because he's weighed down by all of these things, all of these liabilities. So good old Eddie rolls in and you think, oh, he's funny, but we may be onto something here. So just think about that. Let that shift in your brain a little bit. Who's that? It's, uh, it's me, Clark Griswold. What do you want? What do you want? My wife and I came up with a little something special. It's, it's a gift. Put it over there with the others, Greaseball. Uh, just a good old reminder that bosses can be awful. And a good reminder that, you know, why do you want to work for somebody else like that when you have the opportunity? You know, it's so, it's so funny, too, to watch a 1980s movie. And he says, you know, I've been with this company, which we'll hear later in the movie. I've been with this company for 17 years. When does that happen anymore? You know, recent report, even talking about ghosting, employees not even giving a two-week notice anymore because the economy is so booming right now that they can get a job like that. They're doing what's called ghosting. They're not even telling their employer that they're leaving. They just leave 
but he's here 17 years. My, how times have changed, right? Are you okay? Yeah. Bill, did you get your bonus yet? I just talked to my son. Uh, company messenger brought something to the house. I guess mm. that's it. It's scary, right? Like waiting to the last minute, huh? Did you get yours? Well, if it isn't at the house, I'm sure it must be on its way. I don't get that bonus. I'm in it up to here. Don't sweat it. It'll come. Merry Christmas. Same to you. Scary. I mean, we've all been there, right? You're sitting there worrying about money like this. He's sitting there. There's nothing he can do at that moment is going to change anything, right? He can't force this bonus check to arrive at his house. So he's sitting there really scared. And look, I grew up with a lot of fears around money right? That money doesn't grow on trees. We're not worthy of it. You know, we're not the Rockefellers. And he is in that middle class conundrum right now, sitting there worried about this Christmas bonus. And he has leveraged himself too much. It's a scary place to be. I don't, I don't envy Clark at all in this. But then they're able to sit there and have a discussion about Eddie and, and kind of can't understand Eddie's position, which is an interesting uh, dynamic here. Watch this. Yeah, Ruby Sue said something like that last night. How can they have nothing for their children? Well, he's been out of work for close to seven years. In seven years, he couldn't find a job? Catherine says he's been holding out for a management position. <laughs> seven years, he can't find a job. Now, that's laziness, right? You know, he, he's not looking for a job and he's waiting for middle management. That's never going to happen, right? But it's an interesting... It's an interesting dynamic to watch. I don't want to say cast dispersions on Eddie, but here he is making kind of boneheaded decisions about, you know, getting a pool and buying liabilities. And he doesn't even have the Christmas bonus. And he's already outlaid that money on something he doesn't even have. That's just as boneheaded, I guess, as Eddie is, right? He has taken seven years. He still can't find a job. Good old Eddie. Oh, and a reminder about pets in the house. Honey? <laughs> what was that? What just happened? Was that a cat? I told you you had too many plugs in one outlet. Oh, God. What is oh, it? Oh, good old reminder about pets in Let's properties. In. Pets in dessert. rental properties. That thing had nine lives. She just spent them all. <laughs> Woo! I love his blue leisure suit, by the way. Uh, so pets in rental properties. Again, we've done shows here where we talk about, you know, should you allow pets in rental properties? Now, I always fall on the side of yes, because very often uh, tenants that have pets tend to stay longer because it's harder to find rental properties if you have a pet. So if you can be accommodating to somebody, you may find that they'll stay five, seven years in a property uh, and renew their lease. And you can charge them more as well, $50, $70, to, you know, depending on the size of the pet. So it's up to you. But I would say having a pet in a property, not a bad thing, as long as you don't exceed certain weight limits and it's not a dangerous animal that could hurt neighbors and cause you some liability issues. But inside of your property management agreement, of course, you as the landlord are not responsible for the pet. That should be you know, in your property management agreement. It's pretty much standard. Every property management agreement will talk about uh, pet you know, bylaws and so forth. So to make sure that you as a landlord are not on the hook for that. But on the other hand, pets can cause damage. Uh, as Natalie has spoken about, my wife on with an A-class property that she owned in San Francisco, the dogs just peed through the floors, uh, wooden floors, and ruined her hardwood floors. Um, you can have all kinds of problems with pets, so it's kind of up to you. But this is just a reminder as a landlord: you know, do you want to have them have pets or not? And these are the kinds of issues you can end up having inside of your property. So it all comes down to this: Is Clark going to get his big bonus check? for his swimming pool. Something just arrived in the mail. What is it? Clark, what's wrong? Honey? <laughs> it's bigger than you expected? <laughs> <laughs> and Eddie. It's the Clark? best line in the movie when Eddie... What is it? It's a one-year 
membership in the Jelly of the Month Club. Oh, God. Clark, that's the gift that keeps on giving the whole year. <laughs> the whole year. That it is, Edward. That it is indeed. I'm sorry. Now, Clark. that anxiety this turns the into anger. Over the head. Punch in the face I ever... Damn it! Son. So Clark... No, you gotta use the reindeer cup for this. You gotta use the reindeer cup for that. Is eggnog anyway? If any of you are looking for any last-minute gift ideas for me, I have one. I like Frank Shirley, my boss, right here tonight. I want him brought from his happy holiday slumber over there on Melody Lane with all the other rich people, and I want him brought right here with a big ribbon on his head. And I want to look him straight in the eye, and I want to tell him what a cheap, lying, no good, rotten, four flushing, low life, snake licking, dirt eating, inbred, overstuffed, ignorant, blood sucking, dog kissing, brainless, hopeless, heartless, fat ass, bug eyed, stiff legged, spotty lip, worm headed sack of monkey he is. Hallelujah! Holy. <laughs> Where's the Tylenol? Am I a bad parent? Because that's a line that we like to say around the holidays all the time. Blank, blank, blank. Where's the Tylenol? But look, it, it is funny, of course. But at the heart of it is, he, he's you know furious at the company. He's furious at the company. It's always somebody else, right? He's the victim here. I'm sorry, Clark. You're not the victim here, okay? You made a mistake. You put a deposit down on a pool on something you didn't even have yet. You didn't have any money to do that. You're, you're over leveraged and you're mad at Mr. Shirley because of something that you did. This is the middle class conundrum right here. So all of that anxiety over the past few weeks, will that check arrive? Is it going to be showing up here in my mailbox? Nope, it's not. It's the jelly of the month club. But there are other solutions. And of course, it's a warm hearted Christmas movie. So we've got to have a nice resolution. I have never been treated like this in my life. I'm sorry. This is our family's first kidnapping. <laughs> You're fired. Where's the phone? I'm calling the police. Uh, just hold your wad there, fella. Clark had nothing to do with this. This here was my idea. All right. He's still fired. And you are going to jail. <laughs> oh, no. Eddie, it was my fault. I lost my temper when I got my bonus, and I... I guess I said a few things I shouldn't have. Bonus? How did you get a bonus? I cut out bonuses this year. Yeah. And thanks for telling us. I was expecting a check. Instead, I got enrolled in a jelly club. 17 years with the company. I've gotten a Christmas bonus every year but this one. If you don't want to give bonuses, fine. But when people count on them as part of their salary, oh, what you did is just plain... Sucks. Thank you, Russ. You tell him, Dad. My cousin no, that's a great point. His heart is bigger than his brain. I appreciate that, Clark. He's innocent. I'll be more than happy to take the rap on this. On behalf of myself and on behalf of every other employee you rear-ended this Christmas. Now he's feeling bad. What's he gonna do? Sometimes things look good on paper, but uh, lose their luster when you see how it affects He's real looking at the bottom line. I guess a healthy bottom line doesn't mean much if to get it you have to hurt the ones you depend on. It's, it's people that make the difference. Little people like you. So, Carl, whatever you got last year, add 20%. Add 20%. <laughs> That'll knock you out. So, the moral of that part, right, is that I guess if you kidnap your boss, 
have your have your you know brother-in-law uncle kidnap the boss and bring him to your house tie him up and force him to give you a christmas bonus that's the american way that's the american dream what's going on here remember how i was toying with the notion of uh, suspending the christmas bonuses you didn't you well didn't. of all the cheap lousy ways to save a buck that's pretty low mister if I had a rubber hose, I would beat you into I changed chill. my mind. I'm reinstating all the <laughs> If I had a rubber hose. Ah, oh, the wives have to come in and prove once again that the husbands have done something stupid. I know my wife has to do that on a regular basis. Yes, there is definite truth to that. Ah, oh, we find ourselves at the end. I did it. But did you do it at the end, Clark? So let's analyze this. Did Clark make financially intelligent decisions? Is he financially free or is he financially ignorant? I love Clark. I love Clark Griswold and I love this movie. But my grade is that he is financially ignorant. And in fact, Eddie may be in a better position right? He's able actually to live off the land a little bit, kind of get free food from his, uh, from his relatives. I'm not encouraging anybody to do that. But Eddie looks like he might be in a better situation than Clark throughout most of the movie. So is Clark financially intelligent in this? No. He's over leveraged. He's relying on a W-2 employment job. He works for somebody that he can't stand, who doesn't know his name. He's miserable at his job. He hates everyone there, and he's relying on a Christmas bonus to do stupid stuff and buy further liabilities. And yes, in the end, when you kidnap your boss and you force him to give you a Christmas bonus and then add 20% onto it, and the SWAT team ends up dancing in your living room and having eggnog, then we're all a little better off because of that. But no, he is not financially intelligent. So if you want to be a financially intelligent human being, pay attention to this movie and look at it through this lens. So I hope you have a great holiday. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below about this movie and how you plan to achieve financial freedom. Until next time, everyone, go out there and take action and become a real estate investor. I believe it's the number one way to build wealth. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, happy new year, everyone.